Hi there. Hey. I can't see you at all. So, um, haven't Doug and Leah and Divya and everybody put on a great conference? Can we give them a round of applause? This has been a great two days. Well, thank you for having me. I'd, um, I'd like to start actually with uh, a quick reading, um, which, is, uh, which is to say, in the beginning, Tim created the server and the browser, and the web was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the HTTP. And the spirit of Tim moved upon the face of the web. And Tim said, let there be markup. And there was markup. And Tim saw the markup, that it was good, and Tim divided the structure from the appearance. Which is a pretty amazing thing when you think about it, right? Here's a, here's a medium that's meant for visual devices, and yet the structure and the appearance are separate. This is a screenshot I got uh, courtesy of Grant Hutchison, who uh, maintains old computers, specifically so that he can do things like answer questions on Twitter, like, hey, does anyone have a copy of Mosaic that I could get a screenshot of the preferences? So thanks, Grant. This is a preference setting from Mosaic, where the user could say, I want my heading for, my header for, as it was, as it was uh, written here, I want it to have this font family, this font face, this size, this color. As the author, that was not possible. You could not do that. The HTML specification itself, while it had some typical rendering suggestions, did not require that an H1 be 18 point times bold face in black, or any of those, right? It simply said, here's a typical rendering, often very big and bold and so on, um, but was very explicit about not requiring that elements look like that. That's pretty amazing, and it's a fundamental feature of this medium, of the web, right? And it's something that I think we've forgotten about over the years. Um, in part because, as with all creations, there was a fall, and as usual, a reptile was to blame. known in the ancient tongue as Motsila, from Motsi for bringer and la of appearance. You can see here that the first thing that they did at Netscape when they extended HTML was extend it presentationally. Um, okay, so maybe you can't see that if you're in the back, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, the first thing that they say in their extensions is, we've extended is index with a prompt tag. Actually, they meant attribute. We've extended it so that instead of having the default text, this is a searchable index, in the enter search keywords, you could put your own text, like search me, which is I think what everyone did the first time. And then right below that, here are all the cool things you can do with horizontal rules. You can make them not be shaded. You can make them be a size. You can stick them to one side or the other, right? had nothing to do with the separational structure of an HR, it had to do with what it looked like. And then as you go through this document, uh, they have all kinds of fun stuff. The, uh, you know, ordered lists having ABC. Oh look, the image is, IMG is probably the most extended tag. We're gonna align it to the right and the left and you can set a size and a border and all kinds of fun stuff. And then down here at the bottom they say things, uh, this is one of my favorites, um, Netscape should now properly deal with the awful HTML comment sequence. I don't know what's so awful about the HTML comment sequence, but apparently they didn't like it. Maybe it wasn't presentational enough, I don't know. Okay, so this is what happened right off the bat, right? We started getting presentational hacks. Baked into the markup, which is not where it was supposed to be in the first place. This did eventually get us to where we all ended up there for a while, which was with table layout. <laughs> lots and lots of tables, pretty much like turtles, it was tables all the way down there for a while. 
um, but we got better. Uh, in part thanks to the Web Standards Project um, and, and other people who were of like mind in the late 90s who, in addition to saying that browsers really ought to be interoperable, which was kind of a novel concept at the time, kids, ask your parents, um, they, the, the Web Standards Project and the people who supported it also made a big deal out of semantic markup, the stuff that uh, Nicholas was just talking about, right? Um, the idea that we should not be using tables for layout because tables actually had a semantic meaning and you know they needed to be used for that and we should be doing layout some other way. Of course at the time the, the reaction was usually how else are we supposed to lay out pages, right? That's why we were hacking tables and backgrounds and spacer GIFs in the first place. Yes, I say GIFs with a hard G, deal with it. <laughs> hard G represent, come on. All right. I understand, for those of you who think that soft G is the right way, and you're wrong, by the way, that the pronunciation was written into the specification, to which I would say that would not be the first or the last time a specification includes a bug. So thank you. Um, anyway, so there was this pushback saying, we need to be using something else. CSS came along, that's its own story, which I'm not actually going to tell today. Um, the, all the, you know, the implementation problems we had there. Um, but it did lead to kind of a pendulum swinging the other way. Things got a little dogmatic there for a while, right? Um, as often happens with, with matters of religion. Um, where it got to the point where there was a kind of a common joke going around for a while, which was, why did the web designer leave the restaurant? Because he couldn't stand the table layout. <laughs> These are the jokes, folks. Work with me. Thanks. Um, but anyway, so we got past that period, thanks to a, you know, a number of things, including uh, IE5 for the Mac. Woo! The Tontech's still here, a little shout out there. Um, it was a great browser, but then so was IE6 at the time. That's a whole other story. We moved into the era of CSS, right? Which, uh, this is a real thing, by the way. I got this from a picture from Chris Coyer. Thanks, Chris, wherever you are. I'll, we'll work out payment later. Um, so we had CSS to, to lay out our, our documents. Um, except there's kind of a problem with that. Uh, CSS was not a layout language. CSS1 certainly wasn't. If you read CSS1, CSS1 is actually pretty short. Um, as, as Nicholas was talking about, uh, it's not that long of a document. You could print it out and um, probably read it in an evening. Uh, if, you, if you felt like it. It's very simple, and it doesn't have any layout. It's an appearance system, not a layout system. So at this point, let's say we're at about, you know, 2001, still don't have a layout system for the web. Of course, the web wasn't designed primarily for layout, but lots of people using it now, we, we want to kind of lay things out. And, you know, I'm not trying to dismiss CSS. It had a lot of great stuff. I mean, the box model, for example, was a really great thing because it used to be that if you wanted to have your content separated from visible borders with a background, you ended up nesting all those tables, right? It was tables all the way down. And with a box model, you had content and padding and border and margin, all of which you could address separately. Um, but the only thing that CSS1 contained that even came close to approximating the idea of layout was floats. And that's not what they were for. They weren't supposed to be for layout. They were just supposed to be so you could take an image, well, really any element, but it was restricted to images at first, and put it to one side and flow other stuff around it. Okay? And when I say it was restricted to images at first, I mean by the implementations, not by the specification. Right? The whole idea of floats was just we want to put something to one side and flow stuff around it because Netscape did that with the IMG tag when they said we're going to add an align attribute and it can have left or right and then stuff will go around it. Okay. And as we quickly learned, floats can be dangerous. You can have the float drop, right? Remember float drop columns when you're floating your columns next to each other and one of them gets too wide and it drops below the other one? seemed like a really stupid thing for a layout system, because it was, because floats are not a layout system, is, is kind of the point here. Also, uh, float containment. Um, just this past week, 
Like earlier in this week, I had a conversation with somebody who um, has been doing web design for many years, uh, not quite 10, who had no idea why floats wouldn't contain their children, right? And why an element wouldn't grow to expand to contain a float within it, okay? Remember, this is someone who's been doing web design for almost 10 years, but that means that they probably started in about 2004. For those of you who don't know, it's, it's Googleable, but what it comes down to is, again, all Flow was meant to do is put images to the side and put text around it, right? Not a layout system. Um, you could do all kinds of amazing things with floats, right? This is the acid test, um, created by Todd Farner. Well, shout out to Todd. Um, and you could sort of fake layout, but that's all you were doing, you were faking. So, okay, so when working on CSS2, the working group looked at what designers were doing, and I, so far as I can tell, came to the conclusion that, hey, people want to lay stuff out. Who knew, right? People actually want to arrange things on the screen, so we're gonna give them a system. We're gonna give them positioning. Okay, anyone tried to do layout with positioning? I can sort of see you. Okay, yeah, I don't see that many hands. The rest of you are just suffering post-traumatic stress disorder, I assume, because positioning is great um, in very limited cases, but as we all discovered very quickly, if you're not careful with position, you can run yourself into some trouble. Um, as happened apparently in Madison, Wisconsin, to a Toys R Us. Why? It's, <laughs> the only question I have about this poster is, did the people who hung it realize what they'd done and do it anyway? Anyway. <laughs> Creating passionate users. So, position was meant for layout, but it wasn't really sufficient. Um, here's an example of the, what many regard as sort of the first major site that used position for layout, which is wired.com. Doug Bowman did this. Um, I left it blurry on purpose. That's actually not the projector's fault, okay? Because um, that's making a visual point that time has blurred our recollection of positioning, I think. Um, and, and in part because we stopped using it, right? With everyone started using it. And the reason we stopped using it is you can't see it here, but you can see it if you go to the bottom of the page um, this one will be sharper because I actually pulled it off of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, off of Web Archive. Look at the footer. The footer is the width of the center column, right? The reason being that Doug knew if you ever had a situation where that center column for some reason was shorter than the side columns that he had positioned, then they would overlap. So in this situation, if he'd done a full width footer, which is what he wanted, right? He wanted a footer that went all the way across the page. But if he'd done that in this situation, he would have had content overlap. Because positioning lacked two things. Well, it really lacked one thing, but, but it expressed itself in, in two major ways. Um, it lacked any ability to tell if there were um, positioned elements nearby. Like it didn't have any way to avoid other positioned elements. And what that means is that it lacked something that floats actually had, which was clear. That's why we use floats for layout. We had clear, we could clear things below other things. And as it turned out eventually, we could use uh, clear on you know, horizontal rules or generated elements or whatever to create the clear fix, which I know all of you have probably used at some point or another. There's no shame in having done it then. If you're still doing it now, we need to talk. But that's why, I mean, that's why we use floats. I mean, in part because it was all that we had, but because there was clear. Right? We didn't abandon floats and use positioning because positioning didn't have anything like clear. So this whole time, we've been hacking our layouts together. Our layouts are hacks. They're, they're assembled out of the side effects of features of CSS, and HTML in some cases, but mostly CSS, that they weren't meant for that. They simply that's what we could use them for. The same as tables, right? I mean, that's what tables were for. Uh, David Siegel didn't sit down and say, what is the stupidest element I can think of for layout? Table would be great, let's use that. He picked table because it gave him what he wanted. 
It wasn't designed for what he wanted to do, but he was able to bend it to that anyway. Okay? And then he wrote a book, Creating Killer Websites, and it sold like a billion copies, and he owns an island in Fiji or something, I don't know. Um, he's probably retired by now. And uh, same thing with CSS. Same thing with floats. Same thing with positioning to some degree. I mean, Doug made design decisions that were imposed by the technology. He didn't just say, you know, Doug didn't say, I totally want a footer that's just the width of my center column. Okay? And one of the things that I think sometimes we forget is that a lot of our very common design patterns, the stuff that we're very used to now, some, some things that some of us probably don't even question spring out of those limitations. When's the last time you saw a major website or even a semi-minor website that had equal height columns, like visual equal height columns and didn't use tables, okay? Because floats are just as tall as their content and no taller. And positioning, for the most part, is as tall as its content and no taller. You can find ways to try to get it to stretch the entire height of something, but again, because of all those limitations of positioning, like nobody ever went there, right? Um, and so we gave that up. Now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is in some, it's to some degree secondary, right? We might say, well, tch, right, equal height columns. GeoCities 1996 called, they'd like their design patterns back, right? But we need to, we need to stop thinking that way. Because thanks to some recent and, and very soon to come developments, we're moving into an era where we can actually lay our pages out using systems that were designed for layout, which is only vaguely revolutionary. <laughs> and it's only been about 20 years. Some things take time, I guess. But things like flexible box and so on, stuff I'm gonna talk about today, we're actually moving into a point where we have the ability to do the layout that we intend using systems that were intended for that purpose and not having to hack our way um, around the lack of a layout system. So I wanna look at a few of those, um, those things here, starting with uh, viewport units. I don't know if you've used viewport units yet, um, but pretty much there's VH and VW are the basic ones for uh, viewport height and viewport width. And one VH, for example, is one one hundredth of the height of the viewport. Now, you might think that sounds a lot like 1%, but there's a difference. The difference being that 1%, uh, if you say height 1%, you're trying to set the element to have a height that is 1% of its, usually its parent element, but at least its uh, containing block, its sort of its layout um, context. VH is viewport related. It doesn't matter how tall or short the rest of your content is, the VH relates to the height of the viewport. Similarly for, v for VW and width, it's one one hundredth of the width of the viewport. So you can do things like this. This is a, this is a screenshot actually that I took of some elements that are stuck into the viewport. And um, the uh, headings swap around a little bit, at least I hope they have been. Have they been swapping around? Okay, good. Um, that, that's uh, because I recorded video of the, my viewport while I, in my HTML um, document I was um, changing around class names just so I could swap things around. But let me animate that to show when you change the viewport how everything stays, you know, those particular fractions of the viewport height and width. Okay, which is great um, if you're going to be doing something, let's say, like a mobile device or some handheld, uh, a Windows 8 kind of UI, right? Um, now, these are not a cure for everything. Um, the, these are units that help you size things. They're not, uh, these elements don't have any notion of where the others are. So you, it's not like you can change the width of one and it'll shove the others over. We're getting there. This is not that. Um, but you can do some cool stuff. Uh, there's also a vmin, yes, vmin uh, unit, which is the, uh, whichever is the smaller of the viewport height or viewport width. So if I set my font size to two vmin, 
then as the uh, viewport gets resized, so does the text. The font size changes based on whichever is smaller, the height or the width. Okay. So you can actually have your font scalable to the device. Which is pretty nice. There's a, there's a corresponding VMAX, I believe. That's, it is VMAX, right? They, they were going between VM and VMAX, and I'm pretty sure it's VMAX now. Um, so, but that's something that's meant for design. It's actually kind of analogous to the REM uh, unit if you've used REM at all, the uh, root M. So you can say, uh, you can have, say uh, that a, an element should have a font size of one rem, and that will make it have the font size of your, the root element of the document, regardless of any changes of font size between it and the root. So this is uh, actually a very similar thing. So those are, those are cute. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on those because actually Flexbox or Flexible Boxes is a lot more compelling right now. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The, um, the Flexbox spec is actually pretty well supported right, right now. And uh, it's getting close, really close actually to being interoperably implemented. So I created this site, um, just as a mock-up sort of, uh, using Flexbox. And as an example, the little links across the top there, the nav links, those are flexible boxes. Now, I'm gonna hopefully show how those are laid out. Come on, woo -hoo. there we go. So this is just a nav element with an unordered list in it and list items, and the list items have A elements, but those don't really figure in here. And I said that the unordered list should have a display of flex, okay? That immediately made all of the list items be flexible boxes, or at least potentially flexible boxes. Um, and then I said justify content space between. And so it spaced them out automatically with the same space between each one, and all I had to do was just say justify content space between. Um, this is unprefixed in Firefox, and it's still prefixed, I believe, in WebKit. Um, and I'm not sure where Internet Explorer is with that. But there are polyfills. There's a flexi.js, flexie.js, which um, helps um, Internet Explorer deal with um, whatever it, it can't deal with. So, and there's not just space between. Like, this is one way that I can lay things out. And, and the nice thing here is that, um, because of the way space between is defined, the first element is at the beginning of the flex flow, as it's known, and the last element is at the end, and then the other ones are evenly distributed throughout the space. There's also a space around, which is similar, except it balances the space around the sides of each of these, so you end up with a layout more like that. Either way, however, I'm gonna take it back to, uh, oh, shoot, sorry. Oh, stop that. There we go, all right, forget it. Apparently, I've been visited by the dark angel of demos. Okay, so the idea being that um, as you resize, which is what I was trying to show you, and Keynote freaked out on me, uh, when you resize, all the space gets automatically recalculated. So here's a, here's a follow-on example, which will now serve as, serve as my primary example. Um, this box on the left, left, right, okay. I said had a width of 72%, and the one on the right, I said had a width of 10M. And then I said justify content space between. And so I slammed them against the sides and left the leftover space between them, okay? Which is pretty nice, and also you'll notice uh, they have the same height, okay? That border right there is just a left border on the form that contains the, the, uh, the little list there, but it's the same height as its sibling flexible box, because flex boxes by default do that. They equalize their height. Um, that reminds me of something. Does that remind you of anything? Sure seems like we've seen that somewhere before. Um, it's kind of tabley, really. Um, but the space between them flexes, right? So uh, if you squeeze it down, 
it flexes until there is no more and then the two elements jam up against each other. Now what happens at that point, there's a lot of different properties that you can, you can use to affect what happens, which again, I'm, this is more of a high level thing. I don't want to get in deep into the weeds because you know, I have 40 minutes. Um, but these two things are, you know, just, I can place them to the sides. Or I could have said justify content space around if I wanted to balance them that way. That, that was another option that I had. Um, I also, let me see if it shows it here. Yeah, you may have noticed uh, when, I, when, when, it, when it goes out to the maximum extent, the image actually sticks out of its Flexbox parent just a little bit. I actually did that on purpose to show that that's possible. That's, um, to me, that's sort of a key differentiator between these guys and tables. Um, one of the key differentiators, there are many actually. But this is one which is, uh, if you, did you ever try to have content exceed a table cell? I mean on purpose? Because I don't know, I, I, I tried it because that's the life of a spec test author, you know, test suite author. And uh, it was really hard, um, at least, you know, pre-CSS. So, you know the CSS is awesome mug? The one with the box and awesome is like sticking out of the box? I actually unironically love that because it perfectly illustrates something that CSS can do that tables couldn't. So these are just, you know, they're, box, they're element boxes and you can have stuff sticking out of them. You, you know, I could, I could have said overflow hidden and then when the, the layout was sort of maximally wide, the, Im the image would get chopped off at the bottom. Probably a good thing I didn't, but I could have, right? Um, but it has that sort of simplicity to it. So anyone remember this? Anybody? Come on. I know, I, I, a couple of you out there. This is uh, an illustration from the article, The Holy Grail, um, uh, which was published in a list apart um, quite a few years ago now, actually. Uh, it was a follow on to Alex Robinson's one true layout um, technique where you could have uh, floated columns for layout in any order regardless of the document source by doing really, really perverse things with negative margins and padding, positive padding, because there's no such thing as negative padding. Um, again, hacking our way, I mean, it was a brilliant hack. And I use hack in, in the traditional sense, right, of a really clever workaround of a limitation. Um, hacks are great, but usually it's, you know, it's, it's better if the thing that you're working with actually lets you do what you want to so you don't have to hack around it. Um, so this was a follow-on to Alex's One True Layout um, <coughs> article where he showed how to do, you know, these, these, these source independent columns. Um, and this follow-up said, well, what if we want one of those columns to be flexible and two of those columns to be fixed width? How do we do that? And that's what the article said, okay? Well, this becomes really, really, really easy with Flexbox. I'm going to update it. Uh, you know, at the time it was written, we didn't have HTML5, um, so everything was done with, with IDs in terms of saying which part of the layout was which. I just translated it basically to HTML5 equivalents, and this would be the markup structure, right? Very simple. And uh, doing that with Flexbox is this simple. Okay. Display flex and then set a couple of widths. I took the widths directly from the original article, that's why I'm using pixel layout here. Please don't do this for real. But um, just to show how this could be done, you know, the ones on the sides, uh, the nav and the aside have fixed widths and they have no flex, I said flex none. And then the one in the middle has an automatic width and it has automatic flex and if you were to do the resizing thing, then the center column would just get wider and narrower depending on how you resize it and the sides would just stay the same. You, like I say, you don't have to stick with pixels, right? These could be M's and percentages, any length really, any, any layout um, is fine here. And for that matter, um, the source order independent layout is also possible just by using the order property. By saying the article should have an order of two, in this case, because the other guys um, have orders, they're sort of automatically given um, orders of one. Order of two means put it after 
any lower order number. Order is a little bit like Zindex in a conceptual way, but not in a layout way. So, you know, Zindex from here to there. This just basically says anything that has a higher order number goes after the ones that come before it. So that's all I had to do. I didn't touch the markup to change that around. Okay. And so the interesting thing here is that if I were to take this layout and change that main element, um, you see up there it has display flex. If I were to change it back to display block, then the columns, what we're thinking of as columns here, would cease to become flexible boxes of any kind. Which means that they would be laid out in source order, basically. Um, I left them in, left in, the, left in some orders to just show that they don't apply in this case because main is set to display block. And so I can have these in an order that makes sense, let's say for handheld devices, where the header is first and then you have the article, which I'm assuming here is the main content of the document, and then an aside, and then it's the nav, and then a footer. And if you don't like that document order, you can have your own document order, that's fine, right? Put it, if you think that the nav should be between the header and the article, that's great, you can put it there. Um, because when you lay it out using Flexbox, let's say, you can put it in any, or, any order you want. So you have this, and then change that main back to display flex, give these guys an order of one, two, three, and they're laid out in that order regardless of how they are in the source. Okay, so that's pretty fantastic. Also Gesundheit. Because I don't have to think anymore about negative margins and exploiting strange, subtle, wrinkles of the float algorithm. I can just do this and be done. Um, there's a lot of other stuff here too. Like I could reverse the order of the, the layout of these just by, without changing the order, but by using uh, flex direction, or maybe it's just called direction. Anyway, there's a bunch of properties here. Again, I'm not going deep into Flexbox, so I don't, the reason I bring that up is I don't want you to think that this is all that there is to Flexbox because there's a lot more. Um, but this is, kind of gives an idea, right, of, of where we're going with this. Um, there are a lot of possibilities in terms of what you can do for layout, right? So, for example, uh, you can align all of the items this is using the align items property, strangely enough, to uh, have all of them, have all of your, your flexible boxes be jammed up against what's called flex start. Here, that would be up against the top. And their heights would then be content bound, right? Remember when I said that the uh, flex boxes have equal height by default? They do, and I am not representing that case up here because we've already seen a ton of screenshots of that already, but um, align items defaults to stretch but it doesn't have to be stretch. So here, with flex start, I have my traditional like three column layout and all of the boxes are the um, height of their content and no more, right? What we're used to, what we've seen for the last 10, 15 years, okay, let's, let's, let's go with 10. That way I don't feel so old. But also flex end, jam them all against the bottom. And top and bottom here, the reason that these say flex start and flex end is that uh, you, you don't always have to be horizontal, which we'll see in just a moment. Um, you can center them all so that their centers all line up, vertically centered on the tallest of the three. That's right, I said vertical centering in CSS. Yeah, can I get a hallelujah? It's, it's not quite as cool as we would want probably because this is not probably quite the answer to, I have an element and I want it right in the middle of the viewport. Not quite. Although, maybe we could hack it to do that? We're not done with hacks yet, okay? <laughs> I, in, case I, in case I had left you with the impression that hacks are done, no. Um, as, as was pointed out uh, earlier in the conference, we'll never be done with hacks. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Then there's also baseline, which is align these items so that their first, the first baseline in each box, they all line up together, okay? So if you have an H1 in one of them and an H2 in another and an H3 in the third, 
right at the top, those three baselines all line up perfectly. Wow. And you don't, you can do it globally, sort of. You can say for this particular flexible box, I want all of these items to be aligned in this way. You can override that on a per box basis using align self. So uh, in, the, in the upper right, sorry, upper left corner there, that's the flex start, but then for the, for the, for the orange guy there, I said, I'll, you know, I could say align self, flex end, and it gets put down to the bottom, and so on. You can mix and match these however you want, which uh, is a little bit wired, I agree. But um, there you go, you know, the lower right, you have two of them baseline aligned, and then the third one stretches, so that it equals whichever of the other two is taller. And then you can combine these with content justification, because you can justify it all to the beginning or to the end or spread it out or put it in the center or whatever you want to do. And then if you uh, turn this whole thing, so you change the orientation to be vertical, it all happens vertically, which is what each of those is. It's basically just the one we saw before, but rotated 90 degrees. And uh, you can reverse the flows, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff, okay? So that right there, I mean, that would be enough, right? I'm not gonna turn this into an infomercial, by the way. But wait, there's more. But there is more. Um, I just don't expect a call back. Um, it's the end of the day. I know I'm the only thing remaining standing between you and getting home to your scotch or whatever it is that you guys drink here. And uh, so I'm not gonna stay here. I actually want to mention grids. So grid layout, which is not quite as far along as uh, Flexbox, which is why it only gets a few minutes here at the end. Um, grids actually share a lot in common with flexible boxes, um, but you can, you can do some even wackier stuff. So uh, as an example, you can set up grid lines. You can set up grid column lines and grid row lines sort of at the document level if you felt like it. You could do this on the HTML or the body element and then within those, uh, and then take elements and basically hang them off those grid lines to say I want this element to go from this grid line to this grid line, okay? Um, and then inside of those, you can have other grid systems. So you have like subgrids in your grids. It's like, yo dog, I heard you like grids. So I put grids in your grids so you can grid while you grid. Yo. I'm sorry, I'm the whitest guy ever. <laughs> Next time I'll have a lull slide, okay? <laughs> but, and this is, a, this is an even better part, grids and flex boxes are not like completely separate from each other. You can mix them, you can put flexible boxes inside your grids, or you can put grids inside your flexible boxes. So here, um, I might have uh, defined some columns up in the first part, because I wanna lay that part out with, with grid columns, but then down here I have my, let's say, unordered list, hanging off of the, the document grid lines, and then inside of it I said, lay these guys out here using Flexbox. Or, you know, you could go the other way with that, in theory. Um, now the syntax for grid layout can get a little wacky. Um, but it's gonna be okay. We'll get used to it. All right, you can do things like repeats and you can do this min-max stuff and it, and it, gets, it gets pretty fantastic. Um, like here, what's interesting about things like the min-max syntax, um, value syntax is that you can have two possible outcomes for your layout depending on the conditions. So here, uh, the first grid line, the first column line is at 50 pixels and then there's one, uh, the next one is at one fraction, that's what FR stands for, and then min content, which is the minimum amount of space needed for the content that will fit into that column, whatever content might be in that column. And then the last one is the minimum of either the min content or the 1FR. Yeah, okay. But what that means is that if the 1FR wins out in that min max evaluation, then you actually have two fractions and they will be of equal size. But if it loses to min content, then you only have the one fraction and uh, the, the other one becomes min content. The FRs are the parts that are flexible in a grid layout, a lot like Flexbox, okay? Now, I predict a lot of articles from Chris Coyer 
on how you can use grid layout to go crazy nuts, right? Uh, I look forward to those. Actually, I, I hope to, to help figure some of that out um, in the future. But right now, the support is not the greatest. Uh, Internet Explorer 10, actually, is out front on grid support. Uh, so far out front that they implemented an earlier version of the specification, so I don't know where we're going to go with that. Um, hopefully, they'll either polyfill or they'll have a critical security update. I understand they do that from time to time. Um, where they could sneak in a little grid layout update or so, I, you know, we'll see. Um, the, the other browsers are not up to this yet, but they're, they're getting there. They're starting to implement some of the stuff from grid layout. Um, and I will, I actually want to point out min content. The thing about min content is that it is the literal minimum viable distance for the content, which means most likely the width of the longest word of text in your column. I mean, it's great if you have a column of animated GIFs or something, right? Then that's perfect. Um, min content would be great for like a photo gallery layout. Um, but for text, maybe not so much horizontally, but vertically, it's actually pretty fantastic because you can set up a bunch of grid lines. You can say min content, and that can mean the minimum height for your content. That's really useful. Um, so some of these things like min content and max content, I think will be a lot more useful vertically than they will be horizontally. But I don't want to be too constraining because I've been surprised before. Um, and then there's uh, regions, which, um, which are actually kind of fascinating. I know that uh, some of the Adobe guys talked about this before. Um, uh, CJ was talking about some of this yesterday. But there was something that, that I, I just wanted to call out a little bit more here because it's going to be a big shift, um, which is this is how we would usually lay out four boxes of text in a page, right? Four divs or four sections if you want to be HTML5E, um, you know, four paragraphs if you really want to kick it old school. But that's how we do it, right? We would have these four divs. If you want to lay this out with, if you want to flow the content between these boxes using regions, you can do that. And the brilliant thing about regions is that um, it really just says, here's how you like define your content flows and how you lay them out is up to you. You do not use regions to lay out things. You use floats or flexbox or God help us tables um, uh, or grids and then you use regions to say, this is how this goes from one place to another. So we're actually going to end up with structures like this, where all of your content is in one article, is in one element, excuse me, and then you have a, like a markup skeleton that defines the pieces of your layout. And then you lay them out however you're going to lay them out, and then you flow it through using regions. That is a completely different pattern than we're used to, right? We're used to like Nicholas was talking about just, just a few minutes ago, having to have the structure be part of the layout. Well, have to be part of the content, excuse me, basically the structure interleave through the content in order to define the layout. That may not be true for much longer, or at least not necessarily true. It's not as though you have to use regions or else. Um, we don't have a CSS task for, uh, you know, SWAT force yet. Um, but I understand that that's been proposed by Microsoft, so. We'll see how that does on the process track. Um, so, you know, you can define these flows. And then with exclusions, you know, you can define shapes and flow things through shapes, just like CJ was talking about yesterday. So, um, or around shapes. So, taken all together, I mean, what this means really is an end to hacks. Those, by the way, are pieces of equipment for curling called hacks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Man, remember, folks, the show at 7 is different than the show at 10. Okay. Um, the Canadians in the audience appreciated that slide. I'll have you know they're just too polite to tell you. <laughs> okay, so two decades of layout hacks are actually coming to an end. They're not ending today. They're not ending tomorrow. But they'll be ending soon and for the rest of our lives. Um, 
<laughs> exactly, because we have these modules, right, that are designed specifically for layout, and they're designed specifically to work together as needed or work separately if that's, that's how it needs to go. Um, and the interesting thing is, I think we're, we're due for an interesting period. Some of you may remember uh, the desktop publishing revolution of the 1980s and 90s, when people got their hands, like, you know, not, not like professional designers, but regular Joes and Janes got their hands on desktop publishing software, and they used all the fonts, right? Like, everybody's newsletter looked like a ransom note. And it became a thing, and then there was sort of a backlash. It was like, okay, we're done. Can we maybe just use two or three fonts? That would be really lovely um, in, in each newsletter. I think we're likely to go through a similar period, right? Because the kind of layouts that Wired Magazine was doing in print in the 1990s, things like regions and exclusions make totally possible, and people are totally going to do it, and it's going to be completely unusable for a lot of people. Okay, so we're going to go through that period. Right? We're going to go through that period of eye bleeding, yikes, okay? But that's not a bad thing because I think, you know, every major shift like this, people go nuts. They try to figure out everything that's possible. And that's a good thing because by figuring out what's possible, we'll figure out what's best. And so, um, you know, with grids and with the flex boxes and regions and exclusions, all this stuff, you know, there, there, there can be craziness, but there can also be some really great stuff, um, you know, and that, that doesn't even count all the other things that, that, that might feed into this. So, you know, the ability to lay out a page like this for print media using CSS and then have it print like that on every page, right? That's a good thing. Um, and so, like I say, two decades of hacks coming to an end at, and within, within the visible horizon, I feel like. Um, I've, obviously, I've been doing this for a while, this whole CSS thing for a while. Um, and we've had promises of like strong layout systems come along before. This is the first time in a long time I actually feel excited and optimistic that it's for real, that we're actually going to have these systems. So with Flexbox, we already do, for the most part, um, as long as you're willing to polyfill. And grid layout is, implementations are gaining. And um, Adobe's doing a heck of a lot of work with, with um, regions and with exclusions to, to help other um, implementers figure out what to do. So an actual period where layout is on purpose, using systems meant for that purpose. I'm really excited and I hope you are too. Thank you very much, everyone. Apparently, I have time for questions. Yeah, I'm the oh, okay. So I'm the last speaker. So either we can take questions, or everyone can go drink. I mean, I guess it's your choice. Questions? No pressure. No, I'm just kidding with you people. Come on. I have a question about the awesome. uh, viewport units. Yeah. Uh, to me, that seems like a really big thing because I know uh, on the surface, the IE, well, actually, just a lot of the high-resolution devices these days, there's no way to determine the pixel density. I mean, I've looked through mm -hmm. like every way and the inches thing is all relative to not the actual inches of the device because there's no hardware uh, size on the browser, right? So is that those viewport units, are those widely supported? Like what's the support on those viewport units? Because font sizing on high resolution devices right now, it's like so small. Okay. That's like, I yeah. feel like you yeah, pretty much have to like zoom or, you know, so responsive is not quite there yet, I feel like. Right, well, so you should be using M's for your font sizing. But even then, But though. even then, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so I don't, yeah. um, unfortunately, I don't know off the top of my head what the support is. It's actually, it's not, it's not bad is my recollection. It may not be everywhere. But okay. that is another thing that I, uh, that I expect um, should be fairly easy to polyfill. Okay. Would be my hope. If, if it hasn't happened already, Chris is probably sitting over there shaking his head going, dude, you need to read my site. But um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it, there, there's some good support. I, at least two major browser lines of the three that we have, and okay. it might be all three. Cool. But yeah, sorry, I don't yeah, know no. the exact details. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Are all the specs you just talked about today, are they still in draft status? Are they still, or is anything finalized? Well, there's final and then there's final, isn't there? Right. The final, final <laughs> underscore. Um, let's see, Flexbox's candidate recommendation? Yeah, Divi, I knew she would know. Um, and grids are still draft, yes? Yeah, so grids are still draft. And the units should be part of values in units level three, the VH. Okay, so now we're, we're looking. Um, of of the, the major ones, okay, well, sorry, and then regions and exclusions are still draft. So that's why grids, regions, and exclusions got, you know, five minutes at the end, because right. they're still on draft stage. But the other ones are much further along. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Hi. If we want to start using Flexbox today, can mm -hmm. you give any tips on best ways to build in fallbacks? Ah, uh, yes. So that's a, that's a good question. So my... Um, the way that I would build, build in fallbacks is I would put the content in the order that I want it to be in the absence of any flex box, okay? That's where I would start. So, which some people would regard that as a mobile first strategy if that's your buzzword. So you mean like um, the DOM layout? Right, okay. so you know, if, assume that all the CSS went away, what order do I want this stuff to be in? Um, and then do the flex box, th and then uh, you could potentially, depending on where you end up from there, um, use uh, CSS hacks or other filters to supply floats, perhaps to older, uh, older browsers. But um, that's probably how I'd approach it. I, I, I might use positioning instead of floats, depending on what I was doing. Um, but that's that's what I've done when in in past iterations of of these sorts of experiments. It's not going to work in every case. Right, there are, there are likely to be, unfortunately at this point, especially if you're in a situation where, you know, 15% or 20% or 30% of your users are on IE7 and below, right? You're probably not gonna be able to do this, but I would still encourage experimenting with it. Um, hopefully, all of you get at least a little bit of time each week to just mess around, because that's how you learn, right? Um, and so, you maybe take, uh, the home page or the main page that you work on and just re redo it in Flexbox and see how that changes things and like what wacky things you can do with it. Um, and then if you're, you know, if you're only targeting mobile devices let's, with something or if you're, you're, well, sorry, let me, let me re rephrase that. If you have a, your mobile device or your handheld device style sheet, that's maybe where you would do the Flexbox because, you know, hopefully, 98% of your users are, you know, on current browsers. I mean, again, as always, you have to look at your own site stats and figure out what you're going to do. But that floats are the usual fallback because, I mean, that's what people are used to in layouts, right? Mm -hmm. But it's what they're used to seeing. So. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay. Hello, big hey. fan. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for all your work. So. Flexbox or grids, like what do you see taking over like actual business websites out there in a while? Um, yeah, well. Or do you see anything else taking over? Like, long term, I think it'll be both. Short term, it'll be Flexbox because Flexbox will gain wider adoption faster than grid is my guess. And then there will be this period where it'll be all grids all the time. Because uh, I have yet to meet someone who is a traditional designer who didn't long for some form of grid, right. right? And with with uh, one of the things that I sort of implied, but I didn't I didn't make totally explicit with one of the slides, um, or at least I didn't call it out, is that you can say f like for the for the HTML element, I want a column grid line every ten pixels. I please don't, but you can do that. Heck, you could say do it every one pixel. Um, but uh, you, could, you could have like one, one M grid lines to just repeat infinitely no matter how narrow or wide your canvas is and then just hang elements off of those lines, okay? That's gonna be the ransom note era <laughs> of grid layout is when we're gonna see a lot of that. So I think that'll, that'll you know, those will be very uh, popular and then we'll fall back to a mix because Flexbox actually grows out of uh, XUL, Zool, for the Ghostbusters fans in the audience, which I presume is all of you. Um, and that's what they use to, that's what Firefox uses to lay out the browser Chrome, right? So it's great for things like navigations and like creating buttons. It can also be very good for layout. I mean, just like I showed here, but um, 
yeah, I think we're going to end up with that blend. It's, it's more likely, I, th I think, and I've been wrong before when I've tried to do long term forecasts, but I think we're going to have sort of box. grid, like sort of at the h top level, and then flexible boxes inside of the grids. Do you that, see anything else coming up? Besides zone two or? Not so far. I mean regions and exclusions if you consider those, but like I say, those aren't layout things. They're, they're, they describe how you can affect layouts. There really isn't anything at the moment beyond those that I, that I see. But. I'm wishing for Flexbox. Anyways, okay. Well, thank you. Sure. Okay. So I've, I did use, I think we have one more. Okay. I'm glad. Um, I was wondering how grids work with uh, the normal document, document flow. So when you put something in, what happens when you put another thing at that same grid point? Um, so far as I can tell, they overlap. Oh. But there are, um, like it's possible to construct a grid that's really not much more than a coarse grained absolute positioning. Right, where you just say, I want a grid every blah, blah, blah pixels and uh, you know, every blah, 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 and I'm just gonna hang things off of grid lines and they might overlap. With exclusions, you can actually make them wrap around each other, okay? okay. Uh, assuming that there's anywhere for them to wrap. Um, but uh, you can also say I want a grid line, you know, I want like three grid lines at these fixed widths and then I want the next grid line to be as far over as necessary to fill this content, right? And then you can, or, or, you, could, or you can say you want these three at fixed widths and then I want a flexible area and then I want three more, right? So that you can, have stuff that, that flexes. So, uh, yeah, it's, it, th there's two things about grids. One is that it's a little hard to discuss that kind of grid layout in, in like verbally. It'd be a lot easier to whiteboard it. And the other is that I am not nearly expert enough with grids yet <laughs> to do the whiteboard thing. Um, like I understand the basic concepts, but there's very little like practical experience here because of the so far dearth of implementations, right? So we're gonna start figuring that out. Right, and that's, you know, if, if, we run in, if we run into problems with that, then it'll get worked around um, one way or the other, whether we hack our way around it or the specs that we have coming up, like exclusions might be a way to, to fix um, some of those problems. But yeah, it's gonna be interesting. And, and it is, it's a whole new realm because it's a, it, there are systems that we're just not used to. So it's gonna be really fascinating for the next few years. So, is that? Thank you. Awesome. Well, I think that's it. I'm going to turn the microphone back over to Divya.